slightly, uh, probably because of the comments we made earlier this mo uh, afternoon. <laughs> Hans. Thank you so much, Peter, uh, um, for introducing me. And many thanks to Franz and uh, uh, Marcia for inviting me here again. Uh, and obviously I have more uh, voice on right now. Um, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, ten years since I was here last time. Uh, and we noted that in the morning snow conditions were fabulous. So I tested my, <laughs> since four years, new hip and it works. <laughs> also on the ski slopes. Uh, so, um, um, I'm going to discuss PSA and related markers and my um, uh, focus on this, harms, uh, on this um, uh, talk will be to uh, try to discuss uh, if possible ways to try to decrease the harms and focus then on disease morbidity. Uh, um, here named as lethal prostate cancer. Some of the uh, uh, parts of what I discuss relate to inventions that I made in the past, so therefore I put up a disclosure on that. Uh, <clears throat> so what we heard earlier during the lovely first se uh, se uh, session was a discussion about uh, the um, data from a randomized trial. Which clearly have shown that PSA testing can reduce cancer deaths, but also that there is a, uh, a difficult balance between these benefits and the harms of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And that has been discussed uh, in depth. So what I will uh, discuss then is matters how we possibly may improve screening and do it in two ways. One is a, a more risk-ratified approach to do the screening, and then uh, uh, the other aspect will then focus on those men who are being identified by that risk stratification to be at uh, uh, um, risk, increased risk. And uh, this is then, uh, uh, the first part will discuss then uh, the type of data which is based on a population-based sample that we have got access to in southern Sweden, uh, which we uh, um, um, uh, wanted uh, to uh, get access to because we were seeing that in order to improve uh, uh, the balances between the benefits and the harms, we would need additional data. And that data in terms of that we, of course, have population-based data on PSA levels in blood from men at age typical for screening. But mostly, we have it with a, uh, um, a consequence, meaning there has been a screening with uh, a, a, an intent then to act upon uh, the data. Uh, so this is instead uh, where uh, we have an area where there has been uh, very little, if any, screening uh, for many years, and uh, where PSA testing has uh, only recently come to measurable uh, levels, and where uh, the long-term follow-up follow of this co uh, cohort then have focused on the disease morbidity with very careful ascertainment of metastasis or death from prostate cancer. So we published last year in April in BMJ our uh, data on uh, long-term risk of metastatic prostate cancer uh, by PSA measured at early middle age in, uns in, un in unscreened men. So this was a sample uh, of men uh, invited, actually population-based, in Malmö during the mid-70s to mid-80s. It was part of a cardiovascular uh, uh, um, uh, uh, risk study where there was intervention also in terms of uh, risk of uh, 
metabolic disorders and, hi uh, and hypertension. Uh, which then gave blood <clears throat> on a population level. 74% of the invited age groups uh, participated, 74% of the men, and this was based on the population census in the city. And the age group by which they were invited were 33 to 50. And then a subset of these men also were invited then six years later, which explains why we have a second higher uh, eight strata within uh, this pub, uh, publication and some earlier one as, as well. And uh, given the time when these men were invited and that they have been followed for uh, many years as a median of 27 years, there were very little PSA testing going on in this region until uh, more recently than the last five to ten years. And as there is only one hospital in this city where oncology uh, uh, is being treated, so there, uh, which assisted us in terms of the careful ascertainment of death by case note review, which was very high, uh, and then the minority, 25-26%, uh, was only then from the death certificates, which also have a high accuracy, just as in Finland. Overall, given the size of this population, the number of diagnosed pro uh, prostate cancer was very high, uh, close to 1,400. We had 240 plus metastatic cases and 160 plus cancer deaths. And the main bullet data of uh, uh, the paper is shown here, which is um, PSA levels and their association to risk of metastasis. And PSA levels then divide, uh, 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 pre uh, presented as the first black uh, uh, line here, which is the top decile of PSA levels, individuals with a PSA above 1.6. The red one is the top quartal in individuals with a level of 1.1. And then um, compared here uh, with the other graphs that sort of basically drown in this one is then individuals with um, a, a PSA less, at or less of the median, which is close to 0.7. And as you see by uh, years out here, there is wide separation of risk long term for these men. And actually when you quantify that, you see then that PSA is actually a very efficient stratifier of long-term risk of metastasis and death. And here is then not only shown the age group 45 to 49, but also the age group 51 to, uh, uh, to 55. So actually, if we compare then 15 years out, uh, the group with the top decile of PSA levels, either at age 45, 45 uh, 49, or age 51, 55, compared to those with a, a PSA level at median or less at 15 years, uh, there is close to 20-fold difference in long-term risk of metastasis or death. Uh, and as you see, these are cum cumulative risks, so uh, there is a further increase uh, subsequently. But one interesting notion is, of course, also that as a single predictor at one time point, this is clearly not sufficient. Because if we do a cumulative risk at uh, uh, the medium follow, uh, for, uh, follow up for this po uh, population, you would miss a third of the metastasis. So this is a time dependent aspect. And how efficient is it? Well, for example, for those individuals here with the uh, uh, top decile, uh, uh, you would capture about half of all cancer deaths or metastasis in, in these brackets. And of course, you get a larger take then on the individuals here with the top, um, uh, top quartal. Um, 
but of course then uh, uh, are having much lar larger effect on the population level. Uh, and uh, of course the full differences are lower here with top quartile compared to the median, about uh, seven or eight fold. Now this data can then be combined with those data that we published a couple of years earlier, also in BMJ, which is based on um, the aberrant uh, uh, age group that was originally not part of the Malmö Preventative pro uh, Project, but in 1981, the PI of the study decided to invite men aged uh, uh, born 1921, namely then uh, being aged 60 at that point. Again, based on the population census, 71% uh, of these men attended and provided bloods, uh, of which we then uh, um, have bloods from 1167 men and uh, who uh, we then could have follow-up data for 25 years. So either they reached 85 or they had died. And again, this study was then uh, focused again on metastasis and death. And the key point on this paper is again low PSA levels and their associations to risk because we know all from the PCPT trial and other data, that there is no single cut point where you can say uh, that you would be uh, at no risk of a prostate cancer diagnosis, although there is a, a clear increase in risk by levels. But the interesting point here is then that if you take the risk of metastasis or death as the end point instead, the risk becomes again, as we saw in the uh, um, earlier MAN data, becomes very, very low in absolute risk estimates. And <clears throat> that means uh, that you actually then could stratify the population very efficiently uh, for risk at age 60. And it's actually quite surprising then also that if you look at the association between PSA uh, and the endpoint of metastasis or death from prostate cancer, the claim from some uh, 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 who have s um, been involved in some of the reports on PSA and so on, saying that PSA is a very poor marker, uh, uh, I could clearly agree on that PSA testing has lots of limitations, but a marker that has such a high uh, a concordance index to an endpoint of metastasis or death, because if we look at the endpoint of metastasis, it's around 0.85. You cannot really say that it's poor marker in itself, but perhaps it's poorly used. Uh, so if you, in this setting of men age 60, focus on the top quarter, which has a number we recognize quite well, it's a PSA of two, you would, in fact, uh, uh, detect uh, or capture around 90% of the events. Conversely, and perhaps more importantly, as a negative predictor, at this time, uh, a PSA is a very efficient uh, excluder of risk, because 25 years out, uh, the absolute risk es uh, estimates uh, for individuals with, for example, a PSA at or below the median becomes very low. The risk estimate that we publish here is around 0.2% for cancer deaths, and I think it was 05 for metastasis. That, of course, given that we have a 25 years or follow up or, uh, until age 85. So if we would extend uh, life to 1995, we may uh, need to uh, consider all this data much more just in view of what we saw also for the, for the younger men. Now, the key question, and one key question is of course, are these data just unique to this area and this city uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, therefore, never 
possible to replicate because then it would stand little chance to be considered for any future guidelines. So therefore, in working together with Per Statin and his colleagues, Per is here, and we'll lecture later, uh, uh, who have accrued a very large population sample in the Vesterbotten intervention project, which is one of the epic uh, study co uh, um, cohorts. We have set up a, um, a, uh, uh, um, a project which is now well underway. It's then based on men who came in at age 40, 50, and 60, plus 15,000 men in each age range. There is overall some 42,000 men, I believe, uh, uh, who has taken part in this study. Uh, uh, we have um, more than 15 years of follow-up on 12 and a half of these uh, thousand, and a half, uh, thousand men uh, from, uh, from these. And uh, while we um, compile the rest of the data and make them available uh, uh, to present, uh, just, we can share some limited parts on that in terms of the replication in terms of the low risk if we try to assess again the aspect about uh, using PSA as a negative predictor in this age bracket of 60-year-old uh, um, man or, or, or lower. So clearly, we can see that early PSA dim is a very efficient discriminator of risk if we focus on metastasis or death. If we do these measurements early, it's not sufficient long term to just do one test. We need to do repeated testing. But if we look at this at in, in excluding individuals, uh, to be at significant risk if they are below median at early, um, at um, mid to late 40s, early 50s, and age 60, uh, we could then eliminate uh, half of the population uh, uh, from further intervention and declare them very low risk and uh, have very uh, few fatalities from the disease with that kind of approach, most likely. This may affect the, uh, uh, and change the ratio of benefits to harms of the testing, and that is what we have uh, published on in this. Now, as mentioned, PSA testing has limitations. And one of the main limitations, when, and in particular when we're discussing these kind of low concentration levels as putative cut points, it has low specificity. Um, also, it doesn't in itself really discriminate the indolent from the aggressive disease. And we've seen fair amount of overdetection and consequential overtreatment uh, 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 which has been discussed. So this has then also been a topic of a paper which was published uh, a week ago or so, or two weeks perhaps now, in collaboration uh, between uh, uh, um, uh, our team with Andrew Vickers lead, leading this and then the Rotterdam group and the PCPT group, where uh, we have, in consequence of what I just discussed, it's evident then that, that uh, you get a huge amount of overdetection and overdiagnosis uh, if you start uh, uh, to screen individuals uh, with low levels of uh, PSA. Um, and here are the exact estimates on that, and I will not discuss that further because that has already been, been discussed. But so. Uh, the combination of PSA and age is very important to consider in terms of how we should limit the, uh, the, uh, the aspect about the overdiagnosis. So looking then at those individuals who would be considered to be at risk, to, to have some type of risk elevation based on that the total PSA is, is, is elevated uh, in the age bracket that I have discussed. <coughs> 
current practice is that we just go on and do a uh, biopsy on these individuals. And we know, of course, the problem that um, uh, um, 75 or, or uh, uh, 70 to 75 percent of these men don't have evidence of prostate cancer uh, uh, at biopsy. And if we look at uh, metastasis and death data, it looks like 85% uh, would then be free of event many years out. Uh, of course, we could change uh, the um, uh, threshold to increase the specificity. But our approach is actually then something we've taken for a long time. And certainly, you, many of you have heard the rationale for what we are doing on this. It's actually a rationale that started out 30 years ago in my PhD project, where we identified that PSA is a catalytic enzyme, cleaving the gel proteins. And then basically putting a hypothesis that the PSA is a specialized pancreatic gland that is loaded with proteolytic activity. And in order to not have the consequences that we have uh, uh, with acute pan uh, pancreatitis that release trypsin and carmitrypsin and becomes lethal, the hypothesis was then that there is a potent and very powerful regulatory system to keep control of the catalytic activity of PSA. And by that, we identify then first the ligand to PSA, the alpha-1 anticarmitrypsin, as a major, uh, as one of the controlling steps on this. But then also then discovered that we have the free PSA in the blood. And now we know that this system, which in the glandular ducts is catalytic, contains humongous high uh, 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 levels of PSA, uh, basically milligrams per ml of PSA, which is a, it's a million fold higher than that in the blood, and where in the blood this is non-catalytic and surrounded then by inhibitors in 10,000 fold molar access. And then in then trying to describe this uh, system of multiple forms, of which some then in the free PSA fraction were further uh, characterized by using uh, some uh, new antibodies that could discriminate the processing uh, from PSA as a catalytic enzyme into a multi-chain mo uh, molecule that loses catalytic activity when this bond is being cleaved, and then having an antibody radiant that specifically uh, um, recognizes that. Uh, uh, we have then polished these assays for a couple of decades to have them performing, and then uh, having assays then could, that could detect not only total PSA, but also free PSA, the intact subfraction of the free PSA, and the uh, uh, um, PSA, uh, uh, very similar molecule, the HK2, the calcarin-related peptidase 2, which is 80% identical to PSA, but has a unique substrate specificity co uh, compared to PSA. Uh, but also then is present in the blood at very low and challenging con uh, concentration. So f really focusing then on the performance on these assays before we went into something that was large uh, uh, and systematic and was done then uh, mostly together with Jonas in Göteborg and with Fritz and Monique in Rotterdam in, in, in taking in a systematic manner, men who came for biopsy in the screening trial. First, men who hadn't been exposed to prior uh, PSA testing, then those who had been previously exposed to it, and then thirdly, those who had had a prior uh, uh, biopsy. And then, uh, in, uh, 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 then develop a model, first on the tra tra training set, set, and then apply that to an independent uh, uh, test set. And then uh, with the model, look at the performance of the model for predicting biopsy outcome based on the markers. And of course then, also considering the endpoint on the biopsy, any grade cancer or high grade cancer, meaning a Gleason grade four or higher uh, grade at the biopsy. And then look at the uh, predictive accuracy.
So this is then one of the papers that we published with uh, uh, Fritz and Monique in JCO uh, based on these studies, a uh, large sample, uh, and with a uh, findings that if you would accept that some between 15 and 20 percent of the cancer detection uh, were missed, some of these cancers being missed, you could then, with this model, accomplish something like half of the number of biopsy, reduce the biopsy by about half. And important case is then those that you miss, can you live with that? Would that be an acceptable balance? Uh, uh, and, and the case that we showed then there was that the vast majority of those cancers were low stage, low grade that possibly then uh, account for a large amount of the overdiagnosis. And then doing this in multiple iterations on different sample sets, so independent rep uh, replication, and then on longitudinal data, we have seen then consistent performance of this with uh, uh, quite substantial enhancement in terms of areas and the curve and similar cl clinical cons uh, consequences uh, and, and uh, as I di just discussed. Now, what do we do further? Because clearly this is not enough. So one of the aspects that we're doing further and what is currently missing is that we have no data on, on US cohorts. So we have an R1 grant then uh, to go into US cohorts and where the first set of samples have just arrived yesterday to, uh, to New York from the uh, uh, men who were biopsied in the PLCO study. But of course, it's also very important to look at this in a contemporary setting. So doing prospective evaluations uh, together with uh, Mayo, uh, um, Steve Borgian, uh, Matt Cooperberg, and, uh, and Peter Collins in, in, in um, UCSF, and uh, of course also together with uh, our friends and colleagues in Hamburg and the Martini Clinic, and where Alex Hesse is leading uh, um, that arm of the study. Um, what we're also doing, and quite close are being able to present, is that we have taken from uh, the uh, PROTEC study, which was cited earlier, which invited plus 200,000 men in UK for testing, with 82,000 men enrolled, 7,400 men biopsied, of which we could uh, get bloods from 82%, uh, um, uh, 6,100 plus men, uh, most of them with the plasma, anticoagulated plasma, some who only had serum, some who had both, and where we are now uh, setting up an independent replication on this, and uh, um, we are keen to be able to present this within hopefully the next few months, or at least hopefully within this year. <clears throat> Thirdly, I should mention also that, and very interestingly, in what I previously cited also on the replication work we're doing with Pastatin, we have added the four calcarine markers also to that study, and we'll then for the first time be able to report on data where we look at the endpoint of metastasis and death for these markers as well. Now, given that there has been substantial increase of uh, our knowledge of the genetic basis of the disease, We've also asked the question whether or not combining some of the GWAS data to our PSA testing data would uh, uh, make any difference. So we took a second cohort in Malmö from which we had DNA, which we didn't have from the first one, uh, and did a comparison to the PSA testing. And Unsurprisingly, we would say, because the risk, uh, um, the odds ratio, the hazard ratio for each of the SNPs is very small, so they each of them provide very little clinical benefit. We saw little, if any, uh, benefit of taking this approach as such. However, what we also noted 
was that several of uh, these uh, GWAS loci harbor uh, uh, encoded proteins that we use as biomarkers, namely uh, PSA and HK2, as well as the, a, a third marker called PSP94, MSMB, or microseminal protein beta. And when we did a resequencing of the entire calcrine gene loci, we found then no additional loci associated with cancer risk. But what we saw when we used the controls from Henrik Grönberg's uh, large uh, um, uh, case control data set uh, from, from Sweden, we saw that there was very strong association between, and these are small dots here, just representing the uh, 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 loci involved in given an interaction between a, a, a um, non-synonymous chain, meaning an amino acid chain in the coding for the biomarkers and the levels that we then measure in the blood. That is in fact, as we published just very recently, also something that we can observe in the ejaculate here shown for this particular uh, 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 snip uh, in uh, the gene coding for HK2 and seeing the effect of the common versus the rare allele uh, um, uh, homozygous, uh, homozygous uh, uh, individuals with something like an eightfold change in level, which obviously when you use um, these measurements in a marker model intuitively could uh, be uh, uh, speculated on that that would have a large impact on the model performance in terms of misclassification or risk for misclassification. The third marker that I'm uh, uh, cited which has been solidly replicated as a risk associated uh, lo uh, locus, the MSMB, also have uh, exactly the same type of similar effects in terms of large differences in levels that we can measure both in blood and ejaculates as a consequence of uh, this SNP. And in addition, when we use these marker measurements in the multi-ethnic cohort together with uh, Chris Heyman and Bran Henderson, the marker level in itself is associated uh, uh, with uh, the risk, in this case, the risk of prostate cancer. Uh, and is stable for the genetic variation and the uh, ethnicity, although all of that affects this. Uh, the more interesting aspect about the risk-associated levels is actually that high risk is protective and low level is increasing risk. So here is not uh, any aspect about release of the biomarker from the gland as uh, you intuitively would think that that would be the risk association with this marker. So that makes us rethink that aspect as well. And uh, so we have then uh, working towards the future directions, uh, we have incorporated this as uh, one of our key priorities in moving forward in trying to further optimize our approach of, of classifying men at high risk to see whether incorporating SNPs would help us further refine these models and make them more stable and perhaps also more stable across different type of populations with different ethnicity and where we so far only have focused on uh, uh, cohorts which predominantly have a single ethnicity, namely the European ethnicity. Some other aspect that uh, could be cited quickly before I close I think is also interesting in relationship of, of uh, uh, in reference to the use of PSA uh, and its related markers as marker proteins and biomarkers. One being in castrate resistant disease where we know that there is release uh, of circulating tumor cells associated with, particularly with the skeletal lesions. But if we just go to a, a, a blood sample uh, do elysis on uh, the nuclear cell fraction, and then 
look for the gene expression of KLK2 and 3 and a couple of other AR regulated genes. This is in combination with circulating tumor cells better than just doing circulating tumor cells alone. And on its own, it's about comparable to doing the cell cert circulating tumor cells, giving us the message which is consistent with the development of new AR-directed uh, therapies and our new understanding of the castrate-resistant disease that these gene expressions are active in this stage and could be important also in predictors throughout uh, the, the uh, disease spectrum. A third component which has uh, then been launched more recently is the aspect of using our uh, uh, panel of markers, uh, uh, the panel of regions developed in the in vitro assays, namely the uh, 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 antibodies directed against, in this case, free, uh, the free format of prostate-specific antigen, which is the one that is present at huge amounts within the cells and much lower amounts around in the extracellular fluids, or perhaps do it also against the free HK2, which is also now in development, and where perhaps the, that uh, uh, signal-to-noise ratio may uh, uh, be more uh, advantageous. So this is then work led uh, and uh, uh, pioneered by David Olmert, who was previously a PhD student in the lab in Malmö, uh, doing the population-based re uh, research and came up with the idea of why don't we try to do this. And the answer was yes, perhaps we should try to do it and see if it possibly may become useful. Uh, it was tested in later uh, 80s and early 90s, but not against the free formats of the PSAs. And when we test it in different uh, uh, scenograph models, it's very clear that you, using these antibodies, can have a very specific uptake of the antibody uh, uh, within uh, uh, the tumor lesions. And also that you can use it in a way to look at androgen receptor regulated changes, meaning the signaling activity here demonstrated in view of motivation treatment and uh, uh, the different uh, dosages than being uh, re reflected of uh, the uptake of the antibody. And that also, if you implant a uh, um, bone lesion, you also get it to depict exactly the bone lesion and not doing like other imaging methods where you actually just image the uh, uh, change in metabolism of that, that lesion. So that part is then also moving forward uh, with also now a proper and more uh, insightful understanding that there is in fact an uptake of these antibodies within the epithelial cell and there is a clear uh, mechanism to explain this uh, also as well. And by that I close and I thank you for your attention and want to acknowledge many people who have been involved in this research. Not all are mentioned, but many are mentioned. And there is a large team on this, and uh, I'm prepared to take any questions, time permitted. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Hans, I'd like you to address one issue. Uh, in the first part of the conversation, uh, we, there was much talk of that single PSA done at age 40 to 45. From your talk, you've clearly stated you now need three markers, 40, 55, and 60, I believe, is, are the three. Is that sufficient? Uh, if, 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 if a green screening guideline came out for that, would you be able to predict or at least make half the population not get any further testing? So. In, in um, Malmö uh, data, we have looked specifically at the age uh, around 40. We have a replication from the uh, Vesterbotten data together with PER. Uh, we have the age strata 45 <coughs> to 49 in the Malmö data and age 50 in the Vesterbotten data. And 
uh, uh, then the age 60 data, which is very powered in the vessel bottom data, uh, much more power in those than we have in the Malmö data. And they are very, very similar. So my question is though, if you were, does, if you were the czar of the Public Health Committee and you said you could only get three PSAs or two PSAs or one PSA, how many, what's the minimum number of PSAs and at what age should they be drawn to maximize the likelihood of identifying men who are at risk and, and obviously uh, knocking out the men who are not at risk? So eliminating men from further intervention, the number that is currently minimal in our understanding of that would be suggested to be three. One, uh, uh, and here it may be somewhat of uh, uncertainty exactly when to start, but we think it's clearly that age 40, even if we have a stratification at age 40, the benefit is very small. We have seen in the Malmö data that we have separation of the risk curves already at age 51, 55, which makes us worried and have led us to uh, see, um, uh, to look, then look at the age group 45, 49, and say that mid or late 40s would be in the more appropriate time point to start. And that is our current thinking. But of course, by data, more data and longer follow-up follow and perhaps additional co cohorts can have us more insightful on that. And that in, in yeah. terms of when we could stop, it seemed like for men with the median uh, PSA in the, at age 60 or early 60s, that that would pose little risk. Uh, as long as we have life expectancies up to the mi mid 80s. Could you also look for the three PSA in the age problem with the risk? Give any information about the prognosis? So, in terms of single markers and trying to replace PSA, the total PSA in this context, there is no single marker that competes very well with PSA on this. But we are looking at the four markers in this setting on the increased risk, uh, strat uh, on those individuals with an increased risk stratification, and then trying to reclassify that. But in that study, you did not look at it. In that study, you did not look at the free PSA. The in the Malmö study, we, d we uh, have been cautious about uh, these matters due to uh, the way that samples were stored and so, so on and so, so forth. So we've been uh, somewhat cautious about that. We have a very high quality sample from the northern Swedish. So, we, so I think those data are very interesting. They have surprised us very much. So we will, would want to discuss them, but we cannot discuss them yet. So we'll be back on that topic. Yes, we another question. Thanks so much for this great talk on PSA. It's over here. Um, PCA3 and pH index have been widely talked about over the last five years, and this is putting you on a sort of a different ground, but you've been talking on perspectives and calicrins and all this new things going on, but what, do you, what is your view on PCA3 and pH index? Um, we have not done work on PSA3 or, or the Timpresorg uh, very much. Uh, we have some limited publications on them. We have seen little evidence in the literature so far of their ability to discriminate significant risk from low risk. And we have seen also some data about their variability from sample to sample or even from time to time when you run them. Um, so I think uh, as a, as, um, as um, I think it's clear that these markers are cancer associated. Uh, I think it's unclear exactly how we can use them to the best way at the current. And we are waiting for more understanding how we could use them to the benefit, to the benefits of the clinician and in the interaction with the patient. All right, well thanks so much. We need to move on. Thank you so much, Dr.